John chapter number 20. John chapter 20 this morning. Uh, just began to do a little reflecting uh, this morning uh, while I was at the house and thought about, you know, last week I preached on the cross of Christ and uh, Ms. Joan played that beautiful song this morning for an offertory. Uh, where were you when he was on the cross? I thank God this morning that I was on his heart and I was on his mind. Thank the Lord for that. When the Lord got ready to go away, He gave John chapter number 14 to His disciples. They were scared to death. He said, I'm going away. And boy, they didn't know what to do. And He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. For in My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I go and prepare a place for you. I'm going away. I'm going to prepare that place. And if I go away... I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. But when they saw him crucified and his body taken down, I don't know where Peter and the rest of them were. I believe they were in pretty close proximity. Uh, only John the Beloved was standing at the uh, bottom of that cross and with Mary and another a couple of women. Uh, but uh, they saw him taken down the knew that he was put in a tomb and that that tomb was sealed. The darkness that entered their hearts over the next couple of three days. See, they had not yet believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And I thought about how their hearts ached, how their hearts trembled in that day. You get to John chapter number 20. We're going to pick up here. It said the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early. That was on what we would call a Sunday morning. Uh, they couldn't touch that body. He died sometime in the evening on Wednesday. Uh, that, that gives him 72 hours, three days and three nights. Uh, Wednesday was a preparation for a high day, the Bible said, which was a Sabbath. So they couldn't do anything with the body on the preparation to the Sabbath. The high day was on a Thursday. Then Friday was the preparation for the normal Sabbath. They couldn't do anything on that Friday or that Saturday because these days they did no servile work. And so they came early in a tomb. They were coming to anoint his body. We find on that first day of the week, Mary Magdalene. Boy, how that woman loved Christ. <laughs> he saved her from a terrible life. Thank God, he said, to whom much is given, uh, much is required. He said, to whom I forgive much. He said, they love much. When it was yet dark under the sepulcher, seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter, to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and first came first to the sepulcher. And he stooped down, and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. Notice that word, believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. But Mary... Thank God for Mary. Stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeth, seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. 
And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus saith unto her, Mary. Boy, can you imagine what happened in her heart? Boy, that nobody ever said her name like Jesus. Said Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. I thank God this morning for the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I'm glad that they believed. This morning we just went to the garden tomb. It's empty. Some 2,000 years later, uh, that tomb still lies empty. There's never a body has lain in there. I've heard that they've done forensics and everything else, and there was no decaying of any human body in that tomb. I don't know if that's the right tomb or not, but I thank God today, whatever it was, wherever it was, I know what happened that day. He arose from the dead. Interesting, the first mentioned principle of Bible interpretation, the word resurrection. I use a lot of hermeneutics, biblical hermeneutics in studying the Bible. It helps you to rightly divide the word of truth. One of the greatest principles, uh, aside from the context principle, is the principle of first mention. That with the first mention of any subject, God will state His mind on that subject. But then He'll not change His mind. He will enlighten you actually through what's called progressive revelation throughout the Bible. God will never change His mind. So the first use of res uh, resurrection, let me read, it's interesting. The same day came to Him the Sadducees that say there is no resurrection. The first use in the Bible of resurrection was used in disbelief. I want you to think about this just for a moment. Disbelief. There's a lot more people today that do not believe than believe. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision as they decide to follow the atheism, the humanistic, secular uh, ism that's being taught today. They're following that to the far left to their destruction today. Boy, as children after Pan, they follow after the Pied Piper as he piped his way out of the city and took the young people with him. We live in days of lost young people. I call them the lost generation. They've accepted the things of the world instead of the things of God. Over in the book of Luke, he said this, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make His paths straight. You see, God's paths are straight paths. They're straight today. People don't like anything straight. That, they, they, they want you to... We live in the, the world of pretense, and I don't want to get into pol uh, politics, but you know, some people... Uh, pretend they're another gender than their natural gender, even though they look in a mirror every morning and it's say, but now they want me to pretend with them. I don't pretend well. Amen. I don't pretend. Well, we've got a lost generation today. Matthew chapter 7 said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat. When you see the direction of the many, you had better turn around and do a 180, friend. You're going the wrong way. Because straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. That means seeking the truth of the Word of God. They find that truth in the Word of God today. I thank God I'm one of the few this morning and not the many. I agree 100% with Mary as she said, Rabboni, that which is to say Master. I agree with doubting Thomas. Thomas said, My Lord and my God. I thank, 
I thank Him this morning. He's my Lord and my God. I agree with the Roman centurion. He stood over against Him and saw that He so cried out and gave up the ghost and said, Truly this man was the Son of God this morning. Do you believe on Christ? Over in John chapter number 20, verse 29, Jesus said, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. I have never seen Christ, and nobody living in our day has ever seen Christ, but I know whom I have believed this morning, and am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I have committed unto Him against that day. I committed my soul and my life to my Savior. Romans chapter 10, verse number 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Boy, what a glorious salvation by faith in a finished work this morning. 1 Peter chapter 1, 8, he said this, whom having not seen, you love Him. Hey, do you love Him this morning? Thank God. Hey, I love somebody I've never seen. And yet through the eyes of my faith in the Word of God, I have seen Him face to face, my friend. Oh, what a blessing this morning. Though now you see Him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Over in Hebrews chapter 11, the Bible spoke of the women receiving their dead raised to life again. We call Hebrews chapter 11 the hall of faith. Starts out with Abel and goes down through the martyred over the centuries, my friend. I've been people who have died for their faith in Jesus Christ. But he said that they might obtain a better resurrection. If you got a better resurrection, you got a worse resurrection. He dealt with that over in John chapter number 5. He said, marvel not at this, the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear His voice. Every body in every grave is going to hear that voice one day. I still say if Jesus had not specified Lazarus come forth, He would have emptied every grave that had ever been on the face of this earth. That the Lord Himself one day shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with a trump of God. And friend, we're leaving this place. Resurrection of life. He went on and said, they shall come forth, they have done good. That doesn't mean your works. That means you've accepted Christ in a finished work under the resurrection of life and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. Resurrection of life. It's a better resurrection. Amen. I thank God that one of these days these bodies are going to get up. The Lord's going to bring them that have died in Christ with Him when He comes and He's going to bring those bodies out of these graves and it's not going to rip the ground open, friend. These bodies will transcend time and space. They'll be made like unto Jesus Christ with all of the doors and the windows shut. He came through that wall, through that door, through that window and He came and ate with them in that room. I thank God He's coming back for us. It's a better one. The resurrection of damnation to be shunned. It's the resurrection of the unsaved without hope. They will enter into an eternal death where they will eternally live. That's interesting. The Bible calls the lake of fire the second death. Somebody said one time, if you're born once, you'll die twice. If you're born twice, you'll only Die once. We, we sang that song this morning, Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. The capstone of Christianity was that resurrection. Listen, if Christ had not risen, His death would have meant nothing. But He rose again and carried that precious blood that Peter spake about in chapter number 1 and carried that blood into the Holy of Holies in heaven and placed it on that mercy seat. And I thank God this morning it's still fresh. His blood had no sin nature. The Bible called it in the book of Acts the blood of God. Boy, I thank God this morning that He died for us 
But that resurrection this morning, we can rejoice this morning because He's still alive. I want to look at just four or five simple things. We're a little bit longer this morning we're singing, but that's, that's all right. I'm not going to be long preaching, but the resurrection does some things. One, the resurrection gives you boldness in your death. I do not fear death. I don't like the process of death sometimes. If I had my choice, Barbara would wake up and look at me and I'd be... If she had her choice, <laughs> it wouldn't take place. Ever. I've often said I'd love to die in the pulpit preaching. Somebody said, preacher, please don't do that. It'd mess up a perfectly good service. Hey, thank God. Hey, do you have hope this morning? Hey, I thank God my hope is not down here. Now, I'm doing all right right now. Thank God I feel good. I feel as strong as I did years ago. I can't move quite as quick. Boy, God has blessed me with an immune system that is strong. I very seldom get sick or get down or get out. Hey, I've got aches and pains. But listen, one of these days, I'm going to crash, but I won't burn. Amen. I'm going to be like Amelia Earnhardt, all right? You won't know where my body is. I'm just going to crash, and I'm going to go down this morning. I love what the psalmist said, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Has God not been good to you? Hey, you just wait around a little while. Thank God we're going to heaven. Thank God. Hey, one way or the other, I don't have a long time on this earth. I thank God. I pray in the mornings, even so, come Lord Jesus. Hey, my heart, I look around at this world and I get tired. I get sick of it. Sin is a sickening thing. Boy, people don't... Hey, it's, it's just a little thing that ensnares you one little fraction at a time. And then one day you are so bound in bonds that you'll never get out of them. And if you do, you'll bear the scars of the sins of your youth to your grave. But I thank God this morning I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Over in First Thessalonians, he said, And we which are alive, that means saved and remain. You ain't dead yet. You know, we may not have to die. The Bible said after two days Israel shall revive. You say, well, we expected him in the year 2000. Jesus didn't die at 1 AD. He died when he's 33 years old. Usher puts his birth at about 4 BC. So you're talking about about 30 years into the new millennium. Christ died. Hey, we're right on. I, I, I still believe. I'm not setting the time. I'm telling you, God doesn't work by Gregorian calendar. And thank God He doesn't own one of these. His time's not our time. His way is not our way. He'll come when He gets ready. He'll not tarry, my friend. He'll not be late. He'll not be early. He'll be on time and friend, thank God that we which are alive, saved and remain, we're going to be called up out of here. You say, what about the rest of that crowd? According to 2 Thessalonians, they're going to receive a strong delusion that they, and believe a lie that they all might be damned that had no pleasure in righteousness. No second chances for those that have heard the gospel. I'll tell you what, their fate will be sealed eternally sealed. Over in Philippians, Paul said, for to me to live is Christ. There's two twos in there. To me, that's personal. To live, that means to be alive, is Christ. What is your life this morning? When Christ, who is your life, shall appear. I thank God this morning. He's my life. I thank God for it. It'll give you boldness in death. You'll fear it no longer. The resurrection gives us confidence in preaching. I can preach this morning because I know He lives. Started to go to 1 Corinthians 15. Boy, it tells a whole lot of results 
of not having a resurrection. I thank God this morning I can write nip, nip, nip. Just, just mark them off right down the line. They may have, hey, he got up. Wasn't a spiritual resurrection. It was a bodily resurrection. Friend, hey, death had no hold on him. He had to become sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. He had to be made something. That's why when He went to that cross, hey, sin was detestable to hey, Jehovah God Himself. The Bible said He endured such a contradiction of sinners against Himself. Confidence in our preaching. Declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. You say, what is powerful preaching? Powerful preaching is straight preaching. I tell people, you don't have to be hard with the Bible. Friend, that Bible's straight enough as it is. Amen. I get up here as a sinful man preaching a, a perfect Bible to a sinful people. Thank God this morning, confidence in our preaching. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. What I'm saying today, some people laugh and mock at. All I can tell you is have fun. We'll have fun later. The resurrection gives us comfort in our losses. Boy, we've lost some people this last year. Somebody said when they die, they die in threes. We lost Miss Carolyn, then turned around and lost Brother Harold, and then we lost Brother Carol, but we didn't really lose anybody, okay? Huh? You cannot lose that which is not lost. If you know where to find it, it's not lost. Amen. Thank God this morning. Comfort in loss. But I would not have you to be ignorant brethren. Boy, what a large denomination that one is across our land. The church of the ignorant brethren. Ignorant of the Word of God. Ignorant of the context in which Scriptures are written. They're ignorant of rightly dividing the Word of truth. Listen, if you read the Bible right, it will say right. You want to know what God said? Read it. Amen. Don't pull it out of a context and make a pretext out of it. My pastor used to say a verse taken out of context can become a pretext. Thank God for topical preaching, friend. But I'm talking about rightly dividing the word of truth and the context in which God wrote that. And if you'll interpret it right there, friend, you'll be right on the Bible. You'll be right on salvation. You'll be right on everything. But if you pull a verse out of its context, you destroy it. News media is good at that. Comfort in loss. Second Corinthians, he said this. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. We walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. We can lose people. We can preach. And then before you know it, hey, we're going to be home with them. They're all right. Did you hear me? They are okay. Don't you grieve for them. We grieve for ourselves and our loss. But I thank God we get comfort from the Word of God. Then the resurrection gives me assurance of my salvation this morning. Over in John chapter 11, I, I use this quite a bit, uh, especially when you get around funerals and things of this nature. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. The giver of life. When he breathed into the nostrils of Adam the breath of life, that was not putting humanity in him. That was putting spirituality into him. God literally breathed into his nostrils the life of God, which is eternal in its nature. Every man that's ever been born will live someplace forever. Everybody got that? You've got eternal life in your spirit. That doesn't mean you're saved. That means you're an eternal being. You'll spend eternity with Christ. You'll spend eternity without Him. Heaven, hell, choices that we make. Life is full of choices. Learn to make them right. Learn to make them hard. 
When you stand on right, you stand on right. You don't have to be mean with it. You stand with it. The assurance of my salvation. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou? Hey, do you believe that this morning? Thank God. 1 John chapter 5, He that believeth on the Son hath the Son of God hath the witness in Himself. You say, how do you know you're saved? I've got a witness on my inside this morning, Christ living in me. When I got saved, I got changed because I had the Spirit of God come and dwell in my life. Thank God I'm different from this world. I don't want to be like them. I don't want to smell like them. I don't want to look like them. I don't want to look, hey, I don't want to go where they go. Thank God for the assurance of salvation this morning. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have what? Eternal life. Eternal life. These people lose their salvation, gain it back, lose it. They have, no, they have no concept of what grace is. Grace means you never deserved it to start with. That's why salvation must be an act of God. Something God, He grants us repentance. Then He places His Spirit in us. The earnest of our inheritance this morning. That down payment that you don't ever get back. Thank God this morning for assurance of salvation. He said that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. What does eternal life do? Oh, it gives you a, it gives you a, a, a license to sin, preacher. I don't find that in the Bible. My Bible said, Be ye holy, for I the Lord your God am holy. God commands us to be something we cannot be, but we can strive to be. Hey, I'm talking about assurance of salvation. If you're not changed, you ain't got in. That's what God said. Therefore, if conditional any man be in Christ, he is, not was, or will be. A new creature, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's in the present tense. You know why? You get saved, you'll never be the same again. You may go back and try to do something wrong and God will switch you. He'll burn your fanny up. And if God doesn't chasten you, if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. You've had an illegitimate birth. Thank God He whips me. The resurrection gives us assurance of salvation. Then the resurrection gives us a hope in heaven one day. Go back to John. Let not your heart be troubled. Listen, don't you be troubled by what you see out there. You don't have to like it, but I'm not afraid of it. I told somebody the other day, it's because of humanity that these people are going down. My dad used to say, I'm going down like a one-egg pudding. I don't know what that means. Maybe you cooks can explain that to me. A one egg pudding. I guess you need that second fluffy egg to keep that thing up there where it's supposed to be. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a cook. I nuke it. Thank God for air fryers and hair dryers. Amen. Huh? That's about all I get out of that. But I thank God this morning that the resurrection sealed our eternity. We've been sealed into the day of redemption by the Spirit of God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. Everybody talks about those mansions. Aren't you glad they're there? In my Father's house are many mansions. He's not a carpenter. He was a carpenter on earth. He's not building mansions. They have been there from the foundation of the world. They've always been there. Hmm? He said, I go away to prepare a place for you. That was the blood on that mercy seat. Had nothing to do with those mansions, friend. You say, boy, that's Calvinism at its purest. Oh no, that's Bible believing at its greatest. Through the foreknowledge of God, 
Has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? I've heard B.R. Lakin said that. He got it from somebody else. I don't know who got it, but I will say the theology was right. He that knows the end from the beginning, that one friend has already got that new Jerusalem up there. Did you know it's up in heaven right now and it's got to come down from God out of heaven? It's already built. It's already there. Heard somebody say at the predeterminate council of God, God said, what are we going to do? And Jesus said, I'll go die. Don't you believe that garbage? He's as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Thank God this morning for the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Thank God unto a lively hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The greatest day in a believer's life will be their last when they shall see Christ. Over in 1 John chapter number 3, the Bible said, And we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. I thank God this morning when He said, Mary. That wicked woman. She was an ungodly woman. That woman at the well was un, un, ungodly. Rahab the harlot was ungodly. Let me tell you something. Godly people are not born. Godly people are made. Thank God this morning, the greatest day in the life of the believer is when you cross over to the other side or He comes to get you. This wicked, troublesome world, the longer I live, the more I pray with the Apostle John, even so come, Lord Jesus. Thank God this morning that He rose. Up from the grave He arose with a mighty triumph o'er His foes. Boy, I, I like to put old... Uh, Dr. S.M. Lockridge, boy, you need to listen to He's my King. <laughs> and you, you just, if you don't, if, if you've never heard, just type in He's my King. It'll bring up Dr. Shadrach Meshach Lockridge. Thank God this morning for hope. Had a man tell me one time, you Baptists say you know you're saved, and then you say you hope you're saved. I said, oh, no, 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 no. No, no. Heaven is our blessed hope. We know we're saved. Amen. If you're not saved here this morning, you need to come to know Christ. He could come today. If it does, and you've heard the gospel this side, you will never have any time or place on the other side of the rapture. Are you saved? Do you know Christ? Are you safe in Christ? Let's stand this morning. We're going to have an invitation. If you need to come this morning, you come. All these come this morning. If you need to come, you come. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, O Lamb of God. Songwriter said, I.